Welcome to the Table Podcast, where we discuss issues of God and culture. Brought to you by Dallas Theological Seminary. Well, welcome to the table where we discuss issues of the connection between God and culture. And today we're going to discuss the issue of sexuality in general and talk about particularly issues of sexuality as they relate to the family. And I have uh, three experts with me, uh, two colleagues and and someone who I've literally just met, so this is <laughs> great. Uh, I have Debbie Wade and Chip Dickens and Gary Barnes, and Gary and I actually go way back. Uh, Gary and I were uh, attended the same church for years together, served as fellow elders at Trinity Fellowship Church uh, in Richardson for many, many years, and uh, our kids grew up together, and so so this is kind of a treat to talk about family issues with Gary in, in a context in which we're talking about uh, families in the church and how to think about issues of sexuality. And I think to begin, uh, I'll just let each of you kind of introduce yourself by telling us uh, what you do professionally in terms of counseling so we can get oriented uh, to the expertise that you're bringing to us today. And Gary, I'll start with you and we'll just roll around All right. the table. Thanks, Daryl. So I am on faculty here at Dallas Seminary. This next month will be my 16th year of being here. Very good. Wow. And so I um, love having that full-time opportunity of being here. A part-time, I have a private practice as a licensed psychologist working with marriage and families. Mm -hmm. And so um, that's also a day-to-day, -day, part-time experience. Now, you did your training where, at Columbia in New, in New York? I, I came uh, here to mm -hmm. DTS and received my THM degree, mm -hmm. was in uh, the ministry as an assistant pastor at Trinity Fellowship for seven years, and then uh, realized after doing all that was happening and working with marriages and families that it probably would be a good idea to get some more training. So then I <laughs> went back to New York where I'm from and, and got my doctorate in psychology at Columbia. Very good. And Chip? Well, I'm in my 10th year, and uh, I think I'm one of the few guys on faculty that actually didn't go to DTS, but I'm glad uh, I'm glad I get to serve here now. So that's my full-time job as well. And I uh, get to serve as the department chairman, so I get to work with uh, uh, great students and faculty like Gary and get to teach courses. And, uh, and I teach kind of a wide variety of stuff, but have a particular interest in marriage and family. And so when I'm not here on campus, I... Uh, don't have a private practice, but uh, consult and do a lot of training and equipping in the area of marriage and family with churches. Great. And and your degree is? Yeah, I also have a, a degree in psychology. I went to SMU, SMU uh, here okay. locally and did my master's and PhD there. Very good. Yeah. Yeah. And you're a big guy. You must have played sports. You must have played sports. I did. I was a, I was a horse jockey. Uh -huh. No, I'm just kidding. I, was, uh, I, I played basketball. You won the for Kentucky really Derby. big horses. You won the Kentucky yes. Derby for really big horses. <laughs> really big horses. Yeah. I played basketball. That's so great. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that was good. Great. I could you. I, I was a guard. I could use someone <laughs> like you in the post. We could have had a good pick and roll. That's exactly yeah. right. Very good, <laughs> Debbie. Um, I founded. ACT Solutions in 1999, which stands for Authentic Christian Therapeutic Solutions. And so I'm in private practice there. I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist, a licensed professional counselor, and a certified sex therapist. And so I predominantly work with couples, uh, restoring marriages or enhancing intimacy, do quite a bit of recovery of addiction work, sexual mm -hmm. addiction, and then get to work with individuals too, just wanting uh, to have healthy uh, sexual wholeness in their life. Um, I was raised in a Southern Baptist uh, preacher's family, and probably one of my greatest thrills was sitting with my father through a class here at DTS that was a human sexuality class. Oh. And uh, for us to do that together as uh, father and daughter was pretty amazing and brought silence to the room every once in a while, so it was kind of fun. <laughs> um, and I, my master's is from Hardin-Simmons, and then my bachelor was from uh, – Wayland Baptist University, so I have a lot of Baptist in me. <laughs> Very good. All right. Well, that's great. Well, thank you all again for being here, and let me just uh, <clears throat> dive in. Chip, I'll start with you. Let's talk about uh, the biblical view of sexuality and how we should think about sexuality, uh, and uh, and maybe even your take on how the church has either handled or mishandled sexuality. Yeah. I. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, that's probably even an easier place to start is uh, <laughs> w- what not to think about all this. Okay. And, uh, and I-, I can just say, even from my own experience, uh, this was just one of those topics that in Christian circles, uh, we just it was just taboo. You just did not talk Shh, about it. don't talk. I know. Yeah. Everybody, don't make any sudden <laughs> movements. That's right. <laughs> and it really was that way. And for, for me, especially not having grown up in the church, uh, coming to Christ later as a young adult, uh, it, it was kind of strange to me because my assumption was that God and Scripture and uh, had all kinds of relevance to what was going on in my life, and I couldn't wait to figure out what does the church think about this. And uh, I heard nothing. I mean, mm. I literally just would hear nothing. I'd go to Sunday school classes. I'd listen to sermons. I'd ask people in the hallway, uh, <laughs> <laughs> what do we think about this? And, uh, and everybody just kind of said, well, look, I'm kind of late for a thing. <laughs> uh, so it, it, the, the message was really clear that uh, either A, uh, we don't have a biblical view on this, which concerned me, or uh, it's just too uncomfortable for us to talk about. And uh, so that was kind of my takeaway early on, and then even professionally. I can tell you, uh, studying in a, a secular environment, learning how to deal with issues that families come up with, even in that environment, so a totally non-Christian environment, uh, it was difficult uh, to, even in normal classes, to say, okay, what do families, uh, what are they really wrestling with about this issue of sexuality? And so I, that made me feel a little bit better that it wasn't just the church that didn't have a view on it and felt awkward and uncomfortable talking about it. But even in a totally secular environment, it was uh, there wasn't a healthy conversation going on there either. And uh, so I think that's probably one of the things that uh, – I mean, even if I, even if we don't have like a real clear definition or real clarity about it, but just engaging that conversation and getting it going, I think in the Christian communities are really, really powerful uh, uh, force for good. I mean, I, I, I hope that'll be the case for my kids or our students that uh, they don't have those kind of awkward, silent places. Uh, so, so we don't talk about it. So mm-hmm. now that we're going to talk <laughs> no, about it, what do we? What do we? What do you? What would you say? I, I, Where would you lead off? Yeah, I'd, I'd start off with sex is good. Okay, uh, sex is a good thing. Absolutely. It is. Uh, <laughs> jump in, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. I was just absolutely You're affirming it's good. that. Yeah, yeah affirming it. I heard an amen over in the corner. <laughs> that's uh, right. That's right. Uh, not only experientially is it good, mm-hmm. but it's it's a it's a good topic. I mean, it's a good idea. It's a good. Uh, I mean, it's God's uh, design. It's His idea. He authored it, and uh, so it's a positive thing. And so even to get that conversation going in a Christian community, I think would be it'd be great for our first step to be that this is a positive really rich uh, experience between uh, two people that really uh, is an expression of God's heart. There's uh, that that sense of intimacy and closeness uh, that we get to experience within the context of a a husband and wife that uh, really reflects some great uh, traits and great features about what God's uh, love for us is like what his nature is like, and so uh, sex is a good thing. It's a positive thing. Mm-hmm. It's an it's an illustrious thing that it tells us a lot about who Jesus is, yeah, uh, and yeah. his relationship with the Father and the and the Spirit. So, Gary, mm-hmm. you know, uh, Daryl, one of the things I'm really glad to report is now Dallas Theological Seminary has four separate courses on sexuality, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and there's a lot of theology that uh, fuels each of these four courses. And so uh, we need to – we really need to kind of go back and say, okay, let's not just think of what do we need to know that's okay practice-wise mm-hmm. or not okay practice-wise mm-hmm. behind sexuality, but what's really the driving theology behind it all? Right. Well, what's the big idea here? What's mm-hmm. going on? So um, rather than take this, like we often do, this kind of protective approach, uh, we want to take an elevating approach. Mm-hmm. You know, let's, let's not uh, only you know, minimize it, but let's elevate it. Mm-hmm. Now, we don't want to elevate it to the point that we're worshiping it, because mm-hmm. that's not the point either. Right. right. But we tend to you know, either go in the demonizing or, or the deifying mm-hmm. direction mm-hmm. here. And yeah. so, but we, we really have unbelievable theology to elevate it. Mm-hmm. And uh, you know, if I was going to say, what's my one favorite quote I've ever mm-hmm. read on a good theology about sexuality? It comes from Dan Allender, mm-hmm. and he said, 
you know, sex is really a window into the heart of God. Mm -hmm. And so uh, another way of saying it is this is, this is reflective. It, it is our tangible way of learning something really great about God. Hmm. You know, I'm gonna I'm gonna come back to something that both of you are saying that I want to zero in on, and that has to do with how, in one sense, precious sexuality is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, and I, I actually think that that's something that we're losing in the larger yes. culture today, and it's a very important point that's coming from what you're saying. It, it, it it's good. It's something that needs to be elevated. It's a window into who God is, and and. That, it, that elevation is part of what makes sexuality precious, which means that we need to treat it with a, mm. with a kind of respect, if I can say it Certainly. that way, uh, that, uh, that is important. Debbie, what would you add to, to what these two gentlemen have said? I, I brought you in because I wanted to be sure we were gender balanced and stuff. <laughs> gender balanced, three on one, okay? <laughs> That's what it takes to be balanced. Yeah, exactly yeah. right. Yeah, one lady's worth three guys. Okay? She may still have the advantage. That's exactly right. <laughs> you know, I, I just think that – the, the church has made some changes, and finally, the church is starting to talk about sex, and I think that is a good thing. And I, you know, I just think from the the standpoint of us looking at God's design of our bodies and men and women, and that the message to be that when He said after He looked at creation and said it's it's not only good but it's absolutely good. Yeah, which He's my, not good for, enough. You know, <laughs> I mean, you know he, he just says it's absolutely good, mm -hmm. and so this permissive thing to us to enjoy our bodies and to embrace sexuality as a healthy and I, and I loved your word precious thing mm -hmm. because we hear about sex so much and all the distorted things about sex and how our culture has just so distorted but to see sex back as a precious gift that God gave man and woman not just for men to enjoy mm -hmm. but that he designed us as women to also enjoy sex mm -hmm. and uh, it's not just a need for men and desire for men but a need and desire for women as well. And then the context of how he designed it to be within marriage. And, um, you know, I, I think of the metaphor that I've been taught about that God's love for us and his desire for intimacy with us, that the greatest metaphor really is the sexual uh, relationship between a husband and wife that God wants to be penetrating in our lives, he wants to come into us and to know us. Yeah and to be known by us, and he designed us to be receptive and responsive to him. And I just think that's a beautiful metaphor of what is in the design of the intimacy in sex. So you're alluding to here, of course, the idea that just as marriage is declared to be a one flesh relationship, the picture between Christ the, and the church is also uh, compared to marriage and the intimacy and mm -hmm. the preciousness of that relationship. Yes, yes, yeah. and sacredness of that. Exactly. Um, well, that that's a good start. I'm gonna. I, I guess the way I'm gonna start is is just think about in the context of a family. Uh, what advice would you have? And Debbie, I'm gonna start with you on this. Mm -hmm. What advice would you have for uh, parents who are raising children? Uh, and, and really, there are two issues I, I want you kind of to discuss in relationship okay. to each other. On the one hand, there's just how do you talk about sexuality and introduce it? When, when's the appropriate time? You know, when you get the question, you know, how do you do? I, I remember there's a scene in Everybody Loves Raymond in which Raymond is uh, <laughs> asked the question by his nine year old daughter, you know, why are we here? Or how do we get here? And why are we here? And he thinks it's. The sex talk, and actually, she want, really wants to know why we're here. Right. It's, it's, a, it's a life meaning right. question, and it, it's a funny scene yeah. but it, because he comes in all loaded with books and ready to, you know, to get into the details, and, and she, that's not where she's trying to go right. at all. Uh, and so, it, it illustrates the fact that sometimes parents think there's more to a child's question than there really is. And so, I'd like to deal with that on the one hand, mm -hmm. and then the other hand. A deal with the question of how do you, um, in the midst of communicating the preciousness and the value, the elevation and the goodness of what sex is to a child, how do you help them cope with the world that they're living in, which in many contexts is, if I can say it this way, sexually saturated? Absolutely. And so, um, how do we how do we balance those two things? Mm. Okay. Let, let me start by giving just. Uh, a bit of my, my personal experience. 
My parents, uh, probably one of the things I'm most grateful for with them, besides teaching me of who Christ is and giving me life learning lessons all my life of a relationship with Christ, they started with my older sister and me at an early age. Uh, we were six and eight when they began talking to us very directly about sex. So they took the initiative? They took the initiative Mm -hmm. when we were six and eight. Um, They both knew they wanted it different for their children than what it was for them because they came into marriage so naively about Mm -hmm. sex and believed it was such a beautiful thing. So they started with a book when we were young and then just – it wasn't like a one-time talk. Mm -hmm. They allowed that then to be the doorway of all other questions that we could come to them and ask them. And so those conversations, I do believe, need to start early. And I think they can even start earlier than six and eight, Mm. just about the messages to a child when you're changing diapers, that God Mm. made your body and He designed it good, Mm -hmm. you know, and He designed you as a little boy and He designed you as a little girl, Mm. and ways to be able to say, and He designed you with a special purpose. So I think those conversations need to start early, Mm -hmm. and then I think a, a, a crucial thing is is what we are teaching as parents to our kids also needs to be demonstrated hmm. that uh, a husband and wife believes that sex is really good between them. Mm-hmm. I knew that the relationship that my parents had, I wanted. Mm-hmm. Hmm. And so watching them and engaging, and of course it was appropriate affection and attention, but mm-hmm. I knew the fun that they had, that when it came to fighting pressures in my teen years and, and what I saw friends being pressured to do, I knew I wanted what my parents had, Mm -hmm. and everything else seemed less than. And so I think parents knowing that they are the most significant sexual educator in their children's lives, and so being able to take advantage of that and start those conversations early. And I think so many parents are afraid to start the conversations, fearing that if we give our child information, then they'll be so curious and Mm -hmm. want to go explore, when research shows just the opposite, that the ones that seem to be the most curious and take risky behaviors are kids who haven't been told or haven't been taught. So when a parent abdicates, if I can say it this way, the responsibility to communicate the these ideas to their children they really are leaving a vacuum that is that that everything in rushes in and fills is that yes. is that right yes and it leaves this huge vacuum and this void for all the distorted messages to come in and so i think it's so important for parents to just i mean take that privilege and uh, with honor that they get to be the sex educators to their kids and to be confident in what they're getting to share so they've got to believe that it's a good thing in order to teach that it's a good thing. Now, i got a rush of questions <laughs> coming at me, that, that, but I want to make sure we get around the table. So I'm going to put this one out on the table and save it and say I'm going to come back to it. And it's, it, it's this. What about in single-parent homes where the dynamics of a model either don't exist or the dynamics have been um, – been impacted in, to some degree negatively. I, I want to come back to that one because okay. I, because we have more single parent families that we, yes. we deal with on a regular basis. So so that one that mm. put the save button. We're coming back okay. to that question. But uh, Chip, what would you say in terms of advice? To families? Well, what I love uh, what Deb shared there was that it's not the sex talk. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's uh, it's a sex conversation that's mm-hmm. going to happen over the years and. And uh, that just feels so much more healthy because it's a conversation that happens within the context of a relationship where you get to see things and yeah. there's interactions. It's not just a, it's not a drive-by data dump, you know. <laughs> and hey, hopefully <laughs> a gorilla attack. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Here's the pieces to the puzzle. Yeah. Good luck. Yeah, uh, yeah. figure this out. I'm glad. Yeah. I, I'm glad that's over with. Yeah. You know, it's part yeah. of the. And it's just like we would talk with our kids about anything else. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, it's like how we would talk with them about money. You know, I don't. I don't sit down with my kids. Kids, uh, and explain to them how much we owe on the mortgage or what we're doing on our financial. But but I am talking to them about you know early on about how do you save and what do we spend money on and what's God's view about money and it's an ongoing conversation. Mm-hmm. It just makes sense that this really really critical part of what it means to be a, uh, a Christ follower mm-hmm. and what it means to be human that we'd have this conver- ongoing yes. conversation with our kids. Yes. You know, kind of a 
time released appropriate moments as they can handle different information and it just seems to me that that's the context where wisdom really develops and i love deb too kind of the the uh, it's not just informing them it's equipping them to be able to interact with all of those other competing messages because you're right daryl there's so many uh it is saturated mm-hmm. and uh, to be able to to discern okay what what's on mark what's not on mark or uh, how do I deal with all that stuff? You can just get bombarded and overwhelmed with it where uh, you, you just fall uh, really kind of paralyzed uh, to decide exactly how am I going to engage with this stuff as a teenager or as a young adult because uh, the messages are just overwhelming. Hmm. You know, I'd like to uh, give an example uh, <laughs> that it stresses the significance of not just approaching it from the talk mm-hmm. right. uh, because it, it makes me flash back to when I was 12 years old. This time of the year, we're driving from Dallas to my Aunt Betty's house <laughs> at night, just me and Dad. And in the dark, in the car, the talk happened from <laughs> Dallas to Memphis. Wow. And then that was it. That was it. That was I it. was set for life. <laughs> after that. All you needed. And I didn't know. need it before then either. You know? It was that was the moment in time. See, so um, yeah, Debbie's model with her parents and what she's describing uh, is um, Chip's word: the conversation rather mm-hmm. than the talk. Yeah. Boy, if if we can just sell that concept mm-hmm. right mm-hmm. there, and then I would add to it that parents would also not see it as this dreaded thing, but this awesome thing mm-hmm. that they get to participate. It's in part of the as elevation, yeah. because and and I think the thing that makes us feel you know dread about it is we're we're so fearful for for good reasons mm-hmm. of. How this can get derailed for yeah. our kids, because mm-hmm. it can mm-hmm. easily. You know, it, this is a very, you know, vulnerable thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, even though it's precious, uh, and so I think we we kind of default to this too narrow of an approach, and it's a protective approach, mm-hmm. and it's a negative approach. Mm-hmm. And and what our kids tend to hear from us is, don't do it, mm-hmm. and that's the takeaway. Mm-hmm. And it's a kind of a narrow negative protective approach, whereas if we could say, wow, I have this unbelievable opportunity to help prepare for an unbelievable right. earthly experience that's going to be an unbelievable heavenly lesson for you. Mm-hmm. And we're going to just have this in graduated conversations all through your life. So it's a completely uh, complete reframing of the way yeah. in which the conversation is taking place. Mm-hmm. We're moving from a talk to a conversation. We're moving from a negative message that sends the message, this is this is bad or unhealthy or destructive, which of course in certain cases it can be, to, to know in if you think about this in its proper context, this is this is a really significant and positive and beautiful thing that mm-hmm. we're dealing with. Instead of approaching with anxiety to have this in excited anticipation about these opportunities to come, you know, um, much like what it says in Deuteronomy, mm-hmm. where it's speaking of, you know, talk of these things when you're walking on the road and when you're sitting and when you're lying down, of looking for these neat opportunities with your kids and being excited with it, uh, you know, anticipating the questions or anticipating the conversations instead of being anxious about them. So we're talking about, you know, what that, that passage, of course, is dealing with all the issues of life and how God is wrapped up oh, in right. all of it. So, uh, and, uh, you know, so we, <laughs> you know, the other the pic- other mm-hmm. picture is, well, God's wrapped up in all of this, but this over here is right. <laughs> something else. So. <laughs> Uh, great. Okay. Well, that's that's the first scenario I wanted to go through. Here's the second scenario I want to go through. Let's let's go back and say now, what do we do when we're in a situation where we're dealing with a single parent family and and perhaps some uh, dysfunction in the background that's impacting the what what it is that the children see. Okay. And. Yeah. Who wants to take well, the, the balls I'll, on I'll the start ground? Balls on the ground. Just on one <laughs> one dimension of that that I want to start off with is. Um, just the fact that you would be working with a with a one parent situation uh, makes it very possible that there's personal unresolved things for that one parent, mm-hmm. right. and uh, there there's a likelihood for shame and guilt that's still carried over. Mm-hmm. And um, the the big message that would be great for kids 
is to see from your own life how God can redeem any bad situation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's not any situation outside of God's reach that he can't come in, touch it, and redeem it. And so for, for the single parent to really feel God's grace in their life, the redemptive work of God in their life, that's going to model a, a new kind of a freedom for them hmm. that they're going to be able to pass on this concept of God's grace in our lives, in your life as a growing child. And um, so that, that would be what I would say is, is a first key step in the process, so that you would as a single parent, you would experience God's freedom from his redemptive work in your life, no matter what the situation. And, and I would suspect that it's important for the parent to have the view of there may be issues in my own life, but helping to frame how my child is going to experience this and hopefully mm -hmm. in a in a, in, in a positive way is, is an op – we've used the word opportunity – is an opportunity to – uh, to prevent a, a, in effect, a repeat. That's uh, right. Um, and, and going through the same kind of experience. You know, I'm thinking for so many single parents out there where they are. Uh, I mean, it's hard enough with two parents mm -hmm. to, mm -hmm. to manage everything, and uh, just struggling all the time with this feeling like I am in way over my head and uh, feeling under resourced or just incompetent. And it just takes so much courage, I think, hmm. for any parent, but particularly for single parents, to say, I'm going to jump in and initiate this conversation, even though I know that probably the moment out of the gate, I'm not going to be able to control where it goes, or I'm not going to be able to kind of have all the answers. And uh, it, I, it just takes an, an amazing amount of courage, I think, and faith to for any parent to really lead this conversation, even when you don't ha you're not the expert. You know, it's not like you can call Deb and have her come over and have the conversation. Mm -hmm. it's, God's appointed you to do it, and uh, to it's it's just an amazing thing. So one of the things I would encourage single parents to do is to not wait until they feel like they have mastered all the content of everything, because that's right. never going to happen. happen. There's just yeah. there's not enough bandwidth for you to master everything before you. <laughs> you know, then we'll have that conversation. Yeah. So it's that idea of kind of jumping in the river, uh, even though the the boat's quite not built all the way yet, mm -hmm. and. Uh, and you do have to have that uh, grace kind of environment towards yourself, even as you have mm -hmm. that conversation with your kids. But it just takes a lot of courage. It mm -hmm. takes a lot of courage to, to jump out and start doing that before before you have it all uh, mapped out and figured out for your kids, for sure. Yeah. Debbie? And Daryl, I think so much what keeps us uh, or keeps someone from sharing is, is the sexual shame maybe that they still carry and how important that is to work through that uh, for yourself before introducing the topic to your kids so that mm -hmm. you're not bringing the shame into it. But also knowing that I think kids love honesty and authenticity. Mm -hmm. And so when a parent is able to say, I've not done, done it perfect, or things haven't been um, always great for me or good for me, but I trust in the redemptive power of, of God. And here's where he has restored and what he's redeemed and what he's still doing in my life. And so that they know that they can be honest with their children that they may have made mistakes, but also being able to say, I want to equip you to do it differently. And I think there's three words that are real important for parents to think about when they're teaching kids and, and for single parents to go, I, I, I want to be able to educate my children. I don't want them to be ignorant. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm going to equip them with some things so that they feel empowered to stand up against some things. Mm -hmm. And as a, a single parent, recognizing that I need to be educated, mm -hmm. and so choosing to have the resources, uh, seeking those out, and, and I need to be equipped. In my singleness, there's going to be some things I'm still going to be challenged with sexually, mm -hmm. and I want to feel empowered. And so I think if a single person, a uh, single parent can feel educated, equipped, and empowered, then they feel they can educate, equip, and empower their child. Mm -hmm. Now, when, when we're thinking about this, and the, obviously the, the, another question that comes alongside of it is, I've got one parent, obviously I have either a mother or a dad. Mm -hmm. And uh, well, in some cases, in some families, it may be a relative, um, and and so do, should should the parent seek out 
someone of another gender to help their child with this area? I mean, how do you how do you how do you fill the gap? Is actually what I'm yeah. asking. Yeah. Um, what, what advice do you have in that regard for single parents? Well, first I would say if it's a mother and a son, still she start the foundational conversations. Because what we want to say to kids is this is not a topic that's so shameful we can't talk about or that I'm too embarrassed to talk about mm-hmm. it. I want to have this conversation with you. Back to what Gary was saying earlier, I have this great, precious gift mm-hmm. that I, I want to teach you about mm-hmm. that God gave us. So I think to, to start the foundational conversations that mothers have those with sons, fathers have those with daughters, and then being able to say, I realize because I'm you're a boy and I'm not, mm-hmm. you know, that you may want to talk to a, a man about this and That is where I think it's important, whether it's a a close uncle or a healthy grandfather or a youth pastor or a a preacher or a DTS professor that you trust (laughs) that your son knows, to to be able to provide that. And or uh, sometimes it is a counselor Mm -hmm. to say, I just – I want you to be equipped and I'm going to provide that for you if you don't feel comfortable talking to me. But I think, again, if those conversations are started early, Mm -hmm. the more comfortable the child will feel, regardless if it's uh, a son and a mother or a daughter and a father. Any other? Yeah. You know, I I think in addition to what Debbie's pointing out is there's an an amazing way that the body of Christ can um, supplement Mm -hmm. just by, uh, let's say, the single mom and a son. Just by having male role models, just uh, it's not necessarily the talk or the conversation, but it, it would just be involving uh, kids with older guys uh, who are doing guy things, mm-hmm. and the you same know. thing for girls. Yeah, yeah. right. Okay. Yeah, uh, and so uh, it's a way of us just uh, being a body, mm-hmm. a community right. with one another. Mm-hmm. It's really powerful how the body of Christ, not just as an idea, but but real tangibly that God can position and utilize them in people's lives where there are those gaps. Mm-hmm. And uh, to be open to that, to be receptive to it, to, even as a single parent, to expect that and hope that and anticipate that happening as you're in a community where, where folks can fill in those gaps. Okay. Well, that gets us started on kind of uh, dealing with the child. Let me – I guess we're going to move with the child through life. Uh, the child hits teenage years. Okay. Obviously, everything changes. Um, <laughs> uh, everything. <laughs> and so, uh, so now the, you're not speaking so theoretically about things anymore. Now we're in the middle of choices and pressures and uh, and hormones and you know and, and identity. I mean, there's so much swimming around. Uh, uh, what advice do you have to parents with, with teenagers? Hopefully they've gotten the process started, or maybe they haven't. Maybe they realize, mm-hmm. ooh, I'm in trouble. Um, we're, we're on the edge here. Um, what advice do you give to, to parents with teenagers? You know, uh, I have a word from uh, Kathy, my wife. We were having this conversation this morning hmm. earlier. And uh, she, she really highlighted a couple of key things that I, I think would be good right from the start for parents to think about as they're working with teenage stage. And that is, don't think of what you do as a formula. Mm-hmm. And if I just get the formula perfect, then I'll get the perfect outcome mm-hmm. with my kids. Now, it's kind of the distinction between you do want to be a good steward mm-hmm. with that stage of life. Mm-hmm. But don't think of it as the goal of success. Okay. And so what we want is, uh, you know, I'm going to go ahead and, and do my part, but not with the expectation or the pressure right. of if I don't do this right, it's not going to end up right. Or if I do it right, it will end up and right. And so by a formula, you mean having a, a program that you think you have to put together, or a checklist that you go through to make Whatever sure? Whatever your formula is. Okay. I mean, it could look like a lot of different things. Right, right. So, uh, but we have to realize that our, you know our teenage sons and daughters are individuals, and they, they will have their spiritual journey. Mm-hmm. Uh, and 
you could have the perfect formula and their spiritual journey is not going to go where you had in mind for it to go. Now, right. your remark <laughs> triggers something else in my mind, and that is parents sometimes have the idea that they should make every effort to control the environment right. exactly. of their right. child. Right. And, and, and I'm sitting here going, um, <laughs> does that work? I mean, yeah. is that real? even more basic, is that realistic? Well, even research shows us yeah. that that's not it, – it's kind of the parallel experience of – you know, never being exposed to any germs mm-hmm. so that you never get sick. I mean, mm-hmm. there's a natural inoculation. Find that place. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. You know? mm-hmm. yeah. Uh, and now there's always a balance that mm-hmm. has right. to be struck on that. Mm-hmm. Um, but it, it does kind of get to the heart of if I could just fully control this and keep them in an incubator, then they'll. They'll cook well, mm-hmm. you know. Yeah, that's just not going to be how that works. They're, they're going to have to learn how to cope with what is mm-hmm. what is there and around them. Um, okay, you said there were two things. So you said the formula. What was yeah, this? The, what was the this? second thing was uh, don't base your outcomes on premature measurements. Uh, and so, in other words, it's uh, very, very possible if you just look at the statistics that you know by the time. Uh, Boys and girls are 15 years old. Mm-hmm. One quarter of them have had sexual intercourse. Mm-hmm. Uh, by the time they're 18 year old, two thirds of them have. Mm. Uh, after they're at the age of finishing the the first year of college, then three quarters of them. Mm. And and so people aren't getting married at these ages. Right, so we're, right. we're talking about the high frequency of of premarital Marital sex. sex. Yeah. And so if your child is in that category, mm-hmm. which is a high, high number. And you're taking care of a question that was coming next. So. Okay. <laughs> don't, don't say it's all lost. It's all a total right. failure. Yeah. See, because uh, this ongoing conversation yeah. that you've had with them, all of this cultivating over time is still in the works as mm-hmm. well. Mm-hmm. See, and with God being a redemptive God, he's going to use all that. Mm-hmm. See, so, um, so. Don't don't judge outcomes too early, mm-hmm. even when all seems lost. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. And 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 these statistics that you're talking about, uh, the numbers, I, I I don't know, but uh, I take it that the difference between kids who grow up in, in a secular environment or a non-church environment and a church environment don't vary enough to where you don't have to face this question and think about That's it. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> I tried to say that as gently yeah. as I could. <laughs> right on the money. Yeah. 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 So uh, that's a whole other podcast as to how that can be dealt with. But that's a, but yeah. uh, but it, but it, there's a sense in which um, you shouldn't feel that your child is inoculated. Simply because they're in an they're in environments oftentimes that are that are healthy um, that 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 is no automatic protection either, yeah. uh, particularly if you if you step back and let someone else do it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I think it's just good to keep in mind that some of these life uh, events and life movement it just can't be engineered and controlled as much as we would like to be that way. I think it kind of relieves our own anxiety to think that we can manage all that stuff and control it all and predict outcomes, and and it's just not that way. Uh, and uh, and it makes life a lot more interesting and unpredictable, but, but it doesn't mean that we give up, though. And I love that, that message, mm-hmm. that there's a, there's a perseverance. There's this, I'm going to stick with it with my kids, uh, regardless of whether the wheels are wobbling all over mm-hmm. the place on this thing. Now, can there be a danger in too much control? Yeah, yeah, I think so. I think, uh, you know, just uh, this would be true across the board, not just in the area of uh, a teenager's sexuality, but, um, you know, good parenting has that element of that there's structure, there's there are expectations, but it's uh, – it's uh, one where where kids are, uh, you know, especially teenage kids and young adults have have room to be able to really manage their own lives in a safe environment. But there's a, a great deal of warmth and openness on the part of parents that can go along with that structure. So they don't have to be mutually exclusive. You don't have to be someone who controls and has tons of rules and is choking the life out of your kids, and yet uh, is cold and distant and. Uh, but you don't have to be someone who's emotionally warm, and I'm a kid's best friend, and I'm permissive, and we don't have any rules. My, so. my thinking right. of parenting is that that um, you really are preparing a child to 
to live on their own. That's right. And, and yeah. so if that's the case, the more you make decisions for them, particularly the yeah. older mm-hmm. they get, the the worse preparation yeah. you are that's right. you are yeah. uh, you are uh, preparing them yeah. for because you're not preparing them for it. They aren't learning to think for themselves right. and wrestle with things and that kind of thing. And I think that approach, I think people kind of intuitively it, that resonates with them, but it's really hard in this area of sexuality to mm-hmm. actually implement that. Mm-hmm. that right. Approach, yeah. but you know, when we look at the four types of parenting: that there's negligence, there's permissive, that's too permissive, mm-hmm. or there's authoritarian mm-hmm. or authoritative. Mm-hmm. And so, when we look at teaching them about healthy sex, we don't want to be negligent, mm-hmm. and we don't want to be so permissive mm-hmm. that there's no boundaries, and we don't want to be authoritarian that everything's controlled, mm-hmm. uh, but authoritative of helping them to set healthy boundaries. Uh, parenting that we first set healthy boundaries so they understand healthy boundaries. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, again, with that uh, educating and equipping, that they're empowered to decide where they want to keep boundaries or where they want to move them, but making sure that they're making healthy decisions for themselves. And so I think of looking at it in the form of the types of parenting that's helped that we want to be authoritative. Now, just to complete the loop, we've we've talked about child and we've talked about teenager. Um, here's a question that I think oftentimes we don't think in, perhaps enough about or much about, and that is, uh, what's the role of a parent for a child who has gotten married and who's entered into this w- n- this brave new world, if mm-hmm. I can say it that way, mm-hmm. and and now is engaging? What uh, I mean, do you come alongside as a as a friend, do you uh, do you engage them? Do you keep an open ear? Do you let the child um, uh, who's now grown up and is an adult um, uh, determine how that how the interaction takes? What what's the role of a parent after a child has become a, a spouse and maybe even a parent themselves? Mm. Yeah, I, I we're. In that stage right now, we, we I can't have, wait to uh, hear what kind of uh, <laughs> four kids, twenty-seven to thirty-two. So yeah, that's where we are. Uh, yeah. You know, I I think for them to feel like they're always approachable mm-hmm. for right. anything, mm-hmm. and um, that there's not going to be a rejection mm-hmm. or um, a judgment. Um, there's always going to be truth, but there's always acceptance. Mm-hmm. And so uh, for them to just have that sense that there's really not anything I, I can't bring to right. mom and dad, even at this age, mm-hmm. yeah. is uh, a thing that we really want to try to cultivate and keep alive for right. them. And, and again, kind of that from the womb to the tomb, mm-hmm. that, that if those conversations have started early and they've remained natural conversations through right. the – uh, puberty years and mm-hmm. then the adolescent years and the single adult years, then that those are conversations then that continue even in adult to adult relationships with our parents. Mm-hmm. And so if it's, you know, preparing for having children or struggling with infertility, that that you're still that that parent that uh, kids can come to, even adult kids, uh, that you're still askable, still approachable. And you know, hopefully, uh, on the receiving end, you're still teachable. Mm-hmm. You know. Well, I, I, I think it's an. I, I think that's an important question. It also is. It may suggest that there is the potential for, if I can say, this, uh, a real payoff on having the conversation all along the way. Because if you mm, built right. those bridges well when the child was a child and when the child was a teenager, mm. then uh, then you end up actually with a very mature and healthy relationship with your child when they right. grow up, and right. that that's. Uh, that's very valuable and very precious to have and be able to, to uh, experience. Uh, you know, the thing I would add, Daryl, is uh, Kathy and I are kind of talking about this too. At, at this stage of their being young adults, we ha- also have a new opportunity with them, and that is um, we're relating more in a peer relationship, even though we're not peers, and, and there's a greater um, opportunity to talk about our personal failures in mm-hmm. life and to um, maybe fill in the blanks a little more on our story that mm-hmm. we wouldn't have done when they were younger mm-hmm. and to uh, let them have the sense that you know every, everybody's in the struggle mm-hmm. and that it's okay to talk about that yeah. and uh, that we want to encourage and support one another. And we would expect you as, you know, young um, marrieds and young parents to 
have these struggles too and that uh, you would feel free to have conversations So kind of with helping us. them create room create room to have uh, to to get to issues perhaps before they become really super yes. serious. You're making right. space for yeah, that conversation. Yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah. I remember when my parents celebrated their 30th wedding anniversary and they went back to the same cabin that they had gone to on their honeymoon. Hmm. And I, you know, I was single working on my masters and my they were returning from the trip and I was talking to my mom and I said, "So how was it?" She said, "Oh, I wish I'd known 30 years ago what I know now." <laughs> you know? And I, you know, I just loved yeah, it that yeah. she she could be that open and honest yeah. and fun and I know so many people have this concept of, "Oh my gosh, you don't think of your parents having sex." Mm -hmm. But I have never thought that mm -hmm. because from early on, it was always presented again as something good and healthy and wonderful. And I know I have this permission from them, but you know, my father is 82 and my mother 77, and they still enjoy the precious gift mm -hmm. and uh, are able to, as adults, <laughs> we're able to share and have that kind of conversation. Mm -hmm. And I just love that, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, that they feel open about that and that we can have those conversations. So. Okay. Well, uh, we've kind of walked through life with uh, with children. Let me let me shift gears here uh, and go to um, difficult issues. How do you, and re and really this is kind of the X question. You can put any X in the in the slot that you want. Although obviously, what the X is might impact how you deal with this. But let's talk about in general. You you hit an area and you and and you hit a wall. I can say it that way. Whether it, uh, it's a child who is is going to have a baby, or uh, whatever it is, and and in this this X thing happens. Um, what general advice do you have uh, when uh, when uh, the child ends up not going down the path that you would hope right. for, and there's this yeah. terrific disappointment mm. and yeah. sometimes self sense of, of failure, et cetera. Oh. What advice do you have for for people who find themselves in that situation? Mm -hmm. You know, I would go back to um, if you if you just say, how should we even think about sex education mm -hmm. before X or after X? Right. See. And uh, I think that can really help a lot because if we think of it first and foremost as, as primarily about character development mm -hmm. uh, and not just getting the right biological information or even scriptural information. I mean, it's about internalizing that for character development. Whether it's before X or after X, you still have that opportunity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. See, that's always the the opportunity that – we can say, okay, so how, how do we grow here? Mm -hmm. And given where we are right now, how do we grow? Mm -hmm. Right. And, and I think one of the things, if we're wanting to, to instill in our kids grace and mercy and the grace and mercy part of God, the redemptive part of God, then the time to be able to demonstrate that to our kids is if they are going through a time that X has happened and whatever that is, and if it didn't play out the way that we had taught or instilled, then it's still an opportunity for parents to show and demonstrate grace and mercy and continue to teach that there's going to be a redemptive peace in this. And then I think coming back to what we talked about uh, a moment ago, community in the church, uh, that you reach and seek out supportive friends to say, here's what we're dealing with. Instead of staying in shame and embarrassed and feeling like, oh my gosh, this is happening to us, we can't let our Christian friends know, mm -hmm. that it is the Christian friends, the church friends, hopefully that you turn to to say, this is what we're going through, and oh, we so need your support and your prayers, mm. and come alongside us. Mm. And that's really when the church really gets to per participate in mm -hmm. being grace giving and mercy giving and redemptive. So sometimes I find uh, Daryl in, in some of the counseling courses where we're training counselors how to be, uh, you know, uh, uh, with their clients mm -hmm. and uh, this idea of empathy and how do you put yourself in their shoes and feel what they feel and. A lot of times students will go, well, but I don't agree with what my client is doing. Mm -hmm. So, uh, how, <laughs> I'm like, and so we use this phrase a lot of time that empathy is not the same thing as endorsement. Mm -hmm. Right. That uh, um, you know, sometimes as Christians, I think we hold back and we uh, pull our lives back or our hearts back or that warmth or acceptance 
uh, and, and, and empathy because we don't want to be mistakenly endorsing some kind of behavior that's gone mm-hmm. out of balance. And But I think it's good for us as Christians to know those are two completely different separate mm-hmm. operations that we can be totally empathetic and totally with people and not necessarily – that doesn't mean that we're endorsing or advocating for a certain – disaster or position or behavior and the greatest model for that is Christ. Mm-hmm. Right? Christ came to us while we were still sinners. Right. It wasn't like he came to us because he embraced or endorsed our sin. Now that you're good, I'm going to save you. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Fact, honestly, one of my favorite scriptures is where he touches the leper mm-hmm. uh, before mm-hmm. he's healed. Mm-hmm. I mean it's uh, there's just something so powerful about that and uh, and as parents and as a community of Christians, we can be empathetic. We can, we can take the the, the risk of joining with people who, uh, who who we love deeply and can communicate that without ever feeling like we have to compromise mm-hmm. some kind of standard or position or biblical. You know, I, I love that you bring up the leper because you've talked about Jesus, and of course, I work yeah. in the Gospels. And, sure. and one of the things that's interesting is is that the 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 point of that one of the points of that passage is that the presence of the potential for cleanliness is greater than the potential for the presence of uncleanliness. Interesting. Wow. And so, and, wow. and, and so uh, you know, whereas in the thinking, it was the most people had the other thought that, it, right. that it's unclean. The unclean stains the clean. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. And and it's, so this is the other way around. Yep. So the opportunity is to is to touch uncleanness with cleanness, and hopefully, uh, yes. hopefully mm-hmm. engage in such a way that the direction is impacted. If you step back and do nothing, or if you simply shame, That's right. then there's oh, then there, wow. there's no other place place to go. That's right. And you're stuck. So it's it's an yeah. interesting a uh, picture. That's... Interesting yeah. Interesting. So we have that same role as parents with mm-hmm. our kids after X. Right. So, right. <laughs> I, I love the term that uh, Tim Keller gave me called receptive grace. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so it's it's about me moving towards the other. Mhm other, what, right. whatever what it, is it is that separates me or makes me different, mm-hmm. see, if it's a behavior or, or whatever, um, it's, it's moving towards receiving in grace, not based on choices mm-hmm. of the other, mm-hmm. see. Uh, and just, just as Chip was saying, it's not about endorsing. And so we get, we get confused on, like, tolerance. Mm-hmm. And so the idea is this is, like, way beyond tolerance. Mm -hmm. This is actually, at my cost, I'm moving towards somewhat, Mm -hmm. and I'm receiving and embracing them. So It's it's way better than tolerance. It's way better than tolerance. Tolerance is like shooting too low. This is way better than just tolerating somebody. So um, I'm going to concretize this a little bit, and and, and it also introduces another scenario that I want to talk about, and that – because we've talked about, you know, what happens if X happens. But before we get to X, we have the scenario of how do I help my child now? I'm thinking, I'm thinking particularly also of teenagers with issue of choices in a world in which signals are being sent to them that are saying things to them like, that's okay, that's okay, that's okay. Mm-hmm. That may not be okay in certain circumstances, but, but that certainly is. And those okays are things that the, that the church has said, no, wait a minute. Um, mm. May not be okay. Um, mm-hmm. So how do how do you how do you help with those with that tension? Because that is a tension that that every child who lives um, goes through in terms of what they're hearing and what we're back to the I'm back to the sex saturated culture. How do you help a child live in a culture that is sex saturated? Go ahead, Chip. No, yeah. Dive in. <laughs> well, honestly, what I want to have happen is I'm, I, I want for Gary and Deb, I almost want for you guys to like let us eavesdrop in on the conversation that you guys have in the human sex class where you're, uh, everything is just talked about. I mean, mm-hmm. it's just right mm-hmm. down to mechanics and logistics and plumbing and uh, not in a biological sense only, but in a what do we think about this? What does the church think about oral sex? What about anal sex? What about any of these things that uh, it's like, where are we going to have that conversation? So I almost want to like, mm-hmm. go, okay, guys, let's, I want to hear you go for it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. But it's not my show. So, so. again, having <laughs> <laughs> that was that was done so brilliantly. Yeah. That's the ball going into the post <laughs> and coming back to the guard. I can't back. I don't want it. I don't want it. Okay, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. 
Yeah, so have the conversation. <laughs> uh, okay. Too bad time's running out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Well, let's but, not do yeah. that. Uh, but let's but for for parents to just say, I'm I'm in on the conversation. Mm-hmm. I'm just right. there. And let's keep having this conversation. But you have the conversation in a non controlling way. That's in a context where if you've had the conversation all along, this is the beauty of the model of having the right. conversation all along. If you have the conversation all along, when those situations surface and pop up, when those yeah. teaching moments come, they come naturally. They're part of the relationship. Right. Uh, whereas if it if it ha- if that groundwork hasn't been laid, then it's a little harder to to get there. Mm. Right. Um, shows the importance of of getting uh, of working with the right frame. But of course, we're always. We're always faced with with um, with the choices uh, people face and that kind of thing. So so you just do you just dive in? I mean, you know, uh, you know. Here, here's just what's kind of coming to my mind. So I'm just going to go with this. Okay. You know, I think again, kids love for parents to be authentic and real. And if parents always come across as they have the answer and know the answer and all that, they they don't seem very approachable. But if kids make statements or there's an experience, X comes along, for a parent to just look and go, wow, that's a good question. Mm -hmm. I'm so glad you're asking that. Or this is tough, but I'm, I'm glad we're willing to deal with this together. And let's look up some stuff on this together. You know, let, let's look up scriptural backing. Let, let's look up what what are the what are the experts saying? You know, let's go to a, a Christian sex therapy website and and see what they're talking about. Or for a parent to to even say that's that's a really good question. Let me look up some things on that, and and I want to come back to you. Or you look at if, and again age appropriate if the child's old enough. You look up some stuff, and then let's come back and talk about it. But I I, I think. Kids love it when a parent goes, I don't have all the answers and I'm willing to kind of do some research on that myself. So let's work through it together is kind of what you're saying. Yeah, and and taking a moment, whether it's a a reality show of Jersey Shores or Teen Mm -hmm. Mom or whatever, instead of just coming in and going, don't watch that stuff, you know, I can't believe you're interested in that. You know, sitting down and just processing through it morally, spiritually, uh, culturally. Mm -hmm. What what is this saying? What's this doing? You know, what is the intrigue in this? Mm -hmm. Uh, What's the struggle that they're dealing with? Uh, But I I think so often, again, maybe based out of fear, you know, we just, uh, parents want to maybe control too much and back away and say, can't watch that, that's trash. Mm -hmm. You know, can't deal with that. We're not going to talk about that in here. Mm -hmm. Where do I talk about it then? Well, what happens is they get up and they go to their neighbor's house where they're watching, <laughs> watching the show it. together. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. So, where the permissive parents say, saying, "Hey, hey isn't this cool?" Yeah, that's right. And it, 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 I, I, I think I think kids live in a very um, I think we've given kids a very difficult environment in which to function mm-hmm. with Christian values, right. and uh, um, and they're they're faced constantly with choices, and some of the choices. Some of the choices are not even choices they're made. It's just in your face. I, you know, mm-hmm. I, I, I find myself watching television with my grandkids, and a commercial will come on, and I will go, I didn't ask for that, mm. you know? <laughs> yeah, you know? And boom, all of a sudden, uh, I'm in a place that I really don't want to be in, but there we are. Right. And, and, and so it's it's so almost omnipresent mm-hmm. that – that uh, Figuring out how to how to uh, help your kids uh, work through that, I think, is a very very important thing to to uh, consider. Well, uh, I'm, uh, we may run a little over time, so don't get nervous about the time. Let me let me. Uh, there's one other question I definitely wanted to put on the table that I wanted to hear you all address, and it's this question. Um, and, and you'll like this question because it relates to your your uh, <laughs> vocation, and that is, when is it time to say, "I need help"? Uh, when when do you when do you say yeah. um, uh, and, and I know at one level the answer is well we always all need help we all need the support of what the church can give but what I'm asking is when do you when do you think um, you'd advise someone to say uh, you need to you need to really seek some professional counsel because this may be beyond what you're able to deal with 
Uh, the short answer to that question is before you think. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right. Uh, and that we we even see this in research for for marital therapy is most couples are coming to marital therapy seven years too late. Mm-hmm. Right. See, so uh, but this would apply across the board for any topic. Is we we tend to um, think that to reach out for help is going to highlight my inadequacy, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. whereas actually that, that needs to be reframed to say, mm-hmm. wow, I'm, I'm so adequate that I'm reaching outside of myself mm-hmm. for support. I'm seeing better. the world as it really is and yeah. dealing with it realistically. <laughs> yes. It's yeah. actually yeah. a more mature, yes. healthy perspective to go, I can't figure this out mm-hmm. right. without somebody helping me with it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. And it's, a, it's an evidence of, of being uh, not just mature, but free from yeah. – the maturity yeah, yeah. to say, hey, man, I, I got some gaps here. I, I need to do something about this. This uh-huh. would be a good thing for me to do something about this. So many people wait. I'm sorry. No, go ahead. So I think so many people think counseling's for crisis. Mm-hmm. So you wait till everything's in crisis and chaos, and then you go in. Well, then you spend so many hours unpacking the crisis and chaos before you ever get to the real issue. Mm-hmm. So I really do encourage. I, I think, you know, when I do premarital, uh, because I can't go buy gifts and all that, I offer for anybody I do premarital with, I say, any time after your marriage, I'll do one free marital session. And I recommend you come in within the first three months. But any time – and so I've had people call from three months to three years. Mm-hmm. The ones that three years, they're already in crisis, mm-hmm. of course. Mm-hmm. The ones that come in three months afterward are not in crisis, and we're just – But if ma- you see them on the honeymoon, you know you got a good deal, huh? <laughs> <laughs> if they call on the honeymoon, I know they get it. You That's know? right. Um, so, I, you know, I, I think for parents and, and kids that are struggling, that if there's tension building up, then let, let's just say let's go in and get a, a, a third party uh, input here and that we can just sit and process this uh, through. And if it's a couple, again, if, if there's just some struggle, let, let's go in this before it com- becomes a crisis. Um, what we're finding with couples who struggle with vaginismus where consummation can't take place, mm-hmm. then they end up, you know, usually five years before they're in therapy. Mm-hmm. And you can only imagine the um, added problems oh, gosh, that get the, piled on top of the that. The tension and the struggle and the fear of of uh, feeling inadequate on both parties. Yeah, I'm never going to have a child. You know, yeah. I'm not going to have a child. We're not yeah. ever going to be able to have the intimacy. What's wrong yeah. with me? What's wrong with you? Yeah. Um, and if if, the, if they'll come in in the beginning, oh, the prognosis of working through that is so positive. Do you guys notice in your work where you're doing a lot of professional work uh, around uh, sexual issues, do you notice that uh, maybe that initial question like that or initial ask for help is maybe not you guys? But it's maybe more like a primary care physician or uh, their OBGYN. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And it's like, okay, it's safer there to mm-hmm. kind of say, hey, I've got mm-hmm. maybe, or I'm curious. And, and then it ends up being a referral or, right. or encouragement even from the medical profession that mm-hmm. says, hey, you guys need some support or you need mm-hmm. some help or we need to do some reparative relational stuff, not just medication or physical things. Right. Yeah. And sometimes from pastors and, yeah. and youth pastors yeah. Yeah. that uh, they'll hear and say, hmm. here's someone mm-hmm. we'd like to refer yeah, you to. Yeah, and, and I know we stress in our pastoral care with pastors, you know, that they even times oftentimes they may be the first stop, but they need right. to develop the ability to really recognize when they're out of their own league and really need to draw on someone who is able to who's trained to to deal with what it is that they're facing. Um, a key thing in that first stop, though, Daryl, is that whether it's a pastor, a physician, or, or even a lay person in the church, uh, research shows how important it is for that first stop person mm-hmm. to feel very comfortable mm-hmm. inviting sexual questions mm-hmm. uh, because uh, otherwise – People are there, but then they decide not to talk about it because right. the they handle it like the church handles the topic. Yeah, yeah. right. Yeah. right. <laughs> oh, just don't do it. Okay, yeah, 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 so yeah. I got I got your message. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, this has been very, very helpful. I, I, I'm going to let you all have one more round of of what we're going to do. We focused on sexuality in the context of the family. I would like at some point in the future to come back mm-hmm. because I think the second 
obvious topic that's on the table is sexuality in the context of marriage, just the the, mm-hmm. the spouses mm-hmm. themselves, you know, without the uh, added factor of how we deal with this in the context of family and children, and, and also a very very obviously important topic, and uh, and so I so I'm 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 doing this publicly. I'm gonna mm. <laughs> I'm punching my card and saying please, <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, will you come back and consider that? But before we do that, let, I would like for each of you to say you, you've heard the conversation that we've had now for about an hour. Uh, is, is there anything that we have haven't said that you think we should have said, or is there anything you'd like to highlight as you summarize what mm. it is that we've talked about? Okay. Well, one of the things that we probably haven't talked about that would maybe be one of the big X's uh-huh. is if teens come home or single adults come home and they're telling their parents they think they're gay yes. or homosexual. That's right. And I, I think that is something that um, we're, we're really going to have to face and deal with and helping parents. To not have the shock factor or the, oh my gosh, you're kicked out of the house and you can't live here anymore response, of of learning how to walk through that uh, loving well and extending grace and, again, being able to have that conversation on the table to be able to talk through it and not let fear keep parents from talking to their kids about it. And then that would probably be one of the issues that I think counseling would be a great, just when it's first brought out, Mm -hmm. that counseling be a a part of it in the very beginning. That you don't even blink. You say, this is going to require support and help. Yes. And and I can say, I am so thankful I've had the privilege of working with so many parents who have wanted that option for their kids. Mm -hmm. And some of it has come, certainly, I'm going to bring my kid, you need to fix them. Mm -hmm. But most of the time it's been, I don't know how to deal with this, and we want them to have the best support. And I have just loved that. And and the the kids and the young adults have, I think, really have so appreciated their their parents' support. And oftentimes the scenario when that does happen is that you're going to want to interact with both the child and the parents, and not just the child. Uh, I'm yes. sending you to them. You right. know, yeah. Uh, it's a very important part of the understanding what's involved. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Sure. You know, the the other thing I would add is the, kind of the the message that we've been trying to uh, really challenge and 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 champion for parents to kind of take ownership and to take the initiative with talking with their kids about it. I. I think we've kind of said this, but I would really uh, implore uh, pastors to do the same sort of thing. Because in the same way that a a parent would invite that conversation with their kids, uh, pastors can be doing that from the pulpit and lots Mm -hmm. of other ways to to take the initiative and to – Give that uh, that green light for that conversation to be had, mm-hmm. in, even in the context of the broader community. And uh, uh, so, how that gets played out, I know will be different, you know, from congregation to congregation. And I know some churches are really have taken that step. So, yeah, really some churches it. do it. Other churches say, "Well, we're getting ready to talk about X," and so uh-huh. everyone their age. Yeah. Why is yeah. you know yeah. we, we you know you're headed somewhere else? <laughs> yeah. um, but uh, modeling that good conversation right. even in the in the the local community is uh, yeah that, that actually is 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 a good uh, is a good thing to think about alongside in terms of how the church comes alongside the families and, yep. and supports them in creating this conversational yep. environment right. so that it's not just between the the parent and the mm-hmm. and the kid but there's a there's a wider Christian world in which they're seeing this conversation play itself out with many points of potential yep. contact yep. as opposed right. to just the parents, yep. which actually can be reinforcing, hopefully, right. um, in terms of how it works itself out. Gary? You know, as I think about what we've talked about today, uh, I would say my top three takeaways from mm-hmm. our conversation would be, uh, first and foremost, in the family, sex education is, is about character mm-hmm. formation. Mm-hmm. Uh, secondly, um, we want to build this big picture view of celebrate it and don't worship it. Mm-hmm. Right. Uh, and then the third thing would be that uh, in a true celebration of it, it it's going to enhance my worship of God. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It it points me back to something bigger than myself. You know, and, and, and I'm glad we've come and landed here because we started here in one sense, and then we mm-hmm. went through all the nitty gritty, and <clears throat> and we've come back to the point that there is there is something being modeled about intimacy about 
communication about the preciousness of what's going on. And, and I, my own sense is, is that uh, when, when sexuality is viewed as something precious and special, that works against the idea of making it, uh, if I can say it, common and cheap. Yep. Mm-hmm. A- and, um, uh, and one of the things that, the, that I think is confusing about what, the way culture handles sex is they say, it's wonderful and it's for everybody, you know, <laughs> in, 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 in any form and in any expression. And then what you lose is the, is the preciousness of it mm-hmm. and the uniqueness of what it is it's, it was designed to be. And so we take a good thing and we end up um, distorting it. And, and, in, and in the distortion, we actually – it isn't that – the distortion doesn't lead to a participation. The distortion leads to a loss. Mm-hmm. Right. It leads to a loss right. of something and a devaluing yeah. that actually um, – the culture claims it may elevate sex, but in fact it's a devaluing of yeah. it and mm-hmm. very, very important uh, yeah. element of it. Well, I want to thank you all for for this first conversation that we've had on this topic, and uh, uh, I've, I've enjoyed it and, and learned a lot in listening, and my hope is, is that those of us who've been eavesdropping on our table conversation about sex uh, feel like they've benefited as well. We appreciate your being a part of the table and our conversation of the connection between God and culture, in this case, the discussion between God and culture in the area of sexuality. We hope it's been beneficial to you. Thanks for listening to The Table Podcast. Dallas Theological Seminary. Teach truth. Love well. Love well.